Hi everyone, I'm Mayan from the Professor Avram Tsangyan's lab in Ben Gurion University. We're a brain stimulation lab and I'm working with alcohol use disorder, alcohol addiction. And I would like to share with you my interim analysis uh, report so far from 30 subjects. So let's start. So alcohol, as most of you know, the psychoactive substance in, in alcohol is ethanol. And most alcoholic drinks are divided into three major categories, beers, wines, and, uh, and hard liquor, like vodka. And I guess most of you are probably wondering how much is too much, how much in alcoholic drinks. So since it's legal and widely used, it's very culturally acceptable. Uh, around 70% of uh, young adults drink alcohol on a regular basis. Most people are social drinkers. They drink between one to two units of alcohol. One unit contains 12 grams of ethanol. For example, a third of schlich beer, a small glass of wine, or a shot of vodka. Heavy drinkers engage in binge drinking episodes, which include at least four units for women and five for men. And if you're really heavy drinkers, you, you drink at least 21 units per week. So that's social drinking, heavy drinking. How do you get to addiction? You get to, to addiction by first, of course, using, and then use it a lot, increasing your exposure levels, and then you change your perception. Then you start to change your behavior, and in addition to consuming large amounts of alcohol every week, you start to use it to self-medicate yourself. You're no longer using alcohol to uh, have fun with friends and make the party even better. You use it to relieve stress and to relieve any negative feelings that you have. So that's the change in perception that leads to the, the, the behavioral and neurological changes in the brain. How do we define an alcoholic? And the DSM-5 defined alcoholism as a chronic and relapsing brain disease, which is characterized by compulsive drug seeking and taking, despite adverse consequences, sorry, difficult word, consequences directly related to this behavior, okay? So I don't care anymore if it costs a lot of money, if it's hard to get, if it's the middle of the day, I will do it anyway. So to fit the, the, the diagnosis, you need to uh, qualify for two of the following uh, criteria for at least a year. The first one is impaired self-control. I can stop whenever I want to, the classic one. Uh, you want to drink just one or maybe two beers, you have to work tomorrow, and you end up with ten. So this is the first one. The second one is the impaired social commitments. My spouse beca began to notice my changed behavior. I start to get into fights. People say something at work, and it's very easy to follow this one. The third one is dangerous use of the drug. For example, drinking and driving or operating heavy machines. Um, and the last one is the physiological effect. You may develop tolerance or withdrawal symptoms or both. Uh, in Israel, about 5% of the population will fit this criteria of alcohol use disorder. Uh, as you probably may think yourself, uh, the countries with the highest uh, uh, percentage of alcohol use disorders are East Europe, uh, which can be almost a fifth of the population. And in the US, it's around 8.5. So, a key element of the disease is relapse and craving. It's very easy to clean your body out of alcohol or ethanol. It's, ethanol is untraceable after 12 hours, and after a few days, there are no traces at all. The problem is to change the brain circuit that was altered by the uh, heavy consumption and the consequences, I mean, the context of the consumption. And short-term abstinent alcoholics will relapse in the first month, about 60% of them, especially because they are uh, exposed to alcohol-related cues, which will trigger craving in their minds and not in social drinkers' minds, for example. So since it's illegal and it's very, very, very culturally accepted, you are encouraged to drink in a lot of uh, environments. Uh, for alcoholics, it's very hard to stay sober. And it's very hard to break the behavioral ha habit of self-medicating myself with this specific drug. How can we help these people? So currently available treatment is, of course, the famous AA groups. 
which try to help uh, by providing support to these people. Uh, they are, most of them are normal functioning people and they have families and they can hold a job, but that's their way of dealing with stress and any negative events that happen in their life. So the psychological treatment target the, the way they deal with these events, uh, but sometimes it's not enough and sometimes the psychiatrist may uh, help them with some uh, GABA agonist to replace the alcohol if they're especially heavy drinkers. For example, they drink a liter of vodka a day and removing this is too much of a shock for the system, so we need to replace it. And these are very uh, addictive it's an addictive way to get out of addiction, so it's not a very good uh, treatment. So what can we do? How can we look at the brain and be neuroscientists and find a better solution? Let's look at the brain of the alcoholic. Here you can see a con uh, um, MRI scan, a structural one, of control versus alcoholics. First, I want you to look at the white matter damage. Uh, white matter is extremely vulnerable to consumption of large amounts of alcohol. You can see the atrophy in the cerebellum, a bit of the temporal lobes, an extensive damage in the prefrontal cortex, and also in the nucleus accumbens. If we look at functions, specifically resting state fMRI, we can see here the default mode network. The default mode network is a network that is more active when we are awake, but we're not engaged engaging in any specific tasks, we just let our mind wander. And the connectivity within this network can uh, teach us something about the brain pathology in, in different brain diseases. So here you can see the anterior part with the medial prefrontal cortex, and on the right you can see the posterior part with the posterior cingulate cortex and the precanus. You can see in red the alcohol connectivity, the alcoholics connectivity, and in uh, green, the healthy control group, and the overlap in yellow. So you can see more red, which means alcoholics show an out-of-the-network connectivity. It's more expanded, and as we look at it, it's probably less efficient because it is positively associated with abstinent level. The more abstinent you are, the less outside of the network connectivity. In addition, I want to mention the salience network. The salience network includes the anterior cingulate cortex and the insula, and it is more active when we uh, detect cues that are relevant to us, that deserves our attention, that are salient. For example, for us it may be our spouse or something that, very, that pops out in the environment. And for alcoholics, it's also something that has to do with the drug, the drugs related to so you can see here uh, the results of uh, alcoholic brains in response to these cues, for example, pouring on some kind of whiskey and beers uh, inside the fMRI. And you can see that compared to controls, these uh, patients show more activation in the salience network, the ACC and the insula, and also in the ventral media, media prefrontal cortex, the striatum, superior temporal gyrus. I would like to focus on the anterior cingulate cortex, okay? And why would I want to focus on this specific uh, area? Because the, the activity of this area in response to alcohol-related cues was found to be associated with the severity of the addiction, the reported craving levels, and also how much they relapse, like how fast, how, and I want to target this one. I want to try to stimulate these specific regions and try to help these patients. How will I do that? I would use deep brain stimulation, uh, sorry, deep DMS, deep transcranial magnetic stimulation, uh, which allows me to, um, sorry, um, to <laughs> not activate, uh, to excite uh, this specific region. And of course, it's non-invasive stimulation, so I cannot go directly to the ACC without uh, uh, going through the medial prefrontal cortex. So that's why I'm simulating 
both the medial prefrontal and the ACC. The device looks like this, okay? It's a helmet that you put on the head, and I can direct it to the brain region I'm interested in. You can see on top how the coil looks from the inside. And here in the, on the MRI images, you can see a phantom brain with electrodes that shows you the stimulation site. So you can see at the down a row in red, only the electrodes that was, were stimulated above the motor threshold. Of the motor threshold means that I can create action potential. If I direct it to the motor, uh, to the primary motor area, I can induce movements. So only these electrodes were actually stimulated by the coil, and the coil also contains a sham coil, which does nothing. It just makes noise. Using this device, I want to help them clinically and reduce their craving levels and relapse rate. And I also want to look at the brain and see if I make any changes. <coughs> so the procedure goes like this. First, we have come recruit them. Most of them come to us through social media. And the psychiatrist will uh, do the first screening and medical check. And they will fill up the questionnaire, go inside the fMRI, and of course I will check that they, their urine does not contain any alcohol or drugs. Then they will go through three weeks of repetitive, repetitive deep uh, TMS, and they have to come every day for five days a week to get the stimulation. Uh, they will have also an EEG measurement before, on the first and the last one. And when they're done, they're going to the MRI again. After the three weeks of intensive treatment, they come for five uh, visits of uh, follow-up checks for three, uh, in the period of three months. The treatment itself uh, is a high-frequency or sham stimulation for 30 minutes. Uh, most people ask me, how does it feel? It's not pleasant, uh, but you can bear it. And before the treatment, we provoke them by making them pour their favorite alcoholic drink, and then think about it. Think about uh, the time of the day that you're used to drink. Try to imagine it. Try to feel the need to drink. Like it's the end of the day and you're dying for a drink. Try to imagine that. So uh, the results I'm going to show you are from the interim analysis of only 30 subjects. I have more now, it's an ongoing study. <coughs> and I will show you first the clinical results of heavy alcohol drinking in the three months follow-up, and of course the craving levels, self-report, and also confirmed by urine samples. Okay, so, wow. Okay, so binge drinking before and after, baseline three months before and three months after. You can see that both groups improved we have a placebo effect, of course. They come for three weeks. It's, it's like a therapeutic setting for them. But the effect was significant. The interaction was significant. The real group improved more. Craving levels, you can see that we have three time points based on one month follow-up and three months. Only the real treatment group maintained their improvement after three months. And if we look at the brain on the structural level, we found a significant interaction for cerebellar white matter, which is amazing because it is very damaged in alcoholic patients that drink a lot. Um, and we managed to uh, accelerate the improvement that will happen anyway due to abstinence, but the real treatment group actually did it faster. If we look at the volume of specific brain regions that were unknown to be uh, uh, damaged, we found that the thalamus and the insula showed the most significant uh, improvement. And finally, resting state fMRI, we did manage to decrease the connectivity between the default mode network and the salience network only in the real treatment group, which is amazing because I didn't mention it before, it is found to be increased in, in during baseline in, in short-term abstinence. So in a nutshell, in 30 subjects, deep brain stimulation did manage to reduce craving levels and relapse rate, increase white matter, and also reduced resting state connectivity between the default mode network and the right in, in, and the salience network. 
Um, and that's it. That is for now. I hope that uh, when I add my 20 something subject to the end of my PhD, the result will be even more amazing and I'll be able to share with you some BTI, some EEG measurements. And thank you for your attention.